for a certification that is brand new over the last year. We developed the Sustainability Management Certified Professional and also a tier for people who are learning that are certified associates. So uh, we also offer continuing education credits, especially if you're attending these webinars and you need continuing education to stay current in your field, please do contact me and let me know how I could be able to assist you with that too. A little bit about the certification. The certified professional is a designation, and the SMA is actually the accrediting body of that, but it's a designation of a professional who has at least two years of experience working in sustainability. So whether you're an HR professional, a sustainability coordinator, a fleet manager, facilities manager, or procurement manager, you may very well qualify for the higher tier of the certified professional. For our students that are on the call today, we do offer a certified associate for people who are learning and would really like to have a competitive advantage to work for an employer who manages for sustainability as a culture. A little bit about what would be on the certification, it's actually an online exam. It covers the strategic management, how we start with our values and pervade that into our organization and understand what our impacts are, on, are to people, planet, and also profit and how would we be able to manage very smartly with all of the collaboration between our suppliers, our stakeholders such as our customers and all of our com competitors by working together as an industry to make a positive difference. There is a way to get certified. You can visit our website. Please do check it out and please do follow us on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter if you're on any of those social media platforms. A lot of people are studying for the certification by simply looking at the study guide and uh, this is also available on our website too. I'd like to introduce you to some of the people that put all of this certification material together. There are 60 professionals from the business community, utilities, waste management, government and non-governmental organizations that help found the content and the material of how to manage for sustainability. On the call today, I welcome some of our board of directors. I saw Mary Pat Baldoff log in. She is the sustainability facilitator for the city of Columbia in South Carolina. And I also saw Michelle Vicentin logging in as the cash manager for Roblin Contracting in Sacramento, California. So thank you so much for joining the call. I'm sorry if I'm missing some of our other board members, but just to give you an idea about who we are and where we hail from as well. The SMA is very much in a, a believer in being transformative, that we're always continuously improving, and our certified professionals are definitely changing the world around us by leading our organizations with strategy to ensure a healthy society, environment, and economy. And we certainly believe that reaching towards tomorrow that we can ensure today is not going to hurt tomorrow. And so, just please pass the word about the Sustainability Management Association. We're very proud to welcome you to our webinars today, and we hope that you'll spread the word and have your friends and family or colleagues join us for future presentations as well. Today our speaker is the uh, Vice President of Environmental Affairs. His name is Mark Buckley from Staples Corporation and hails from Massachusetts this morning. And just to give you a heads up for our calendar for next week, for next month, we have Jana Vertenberg, the president of Transitioning to Green, presenting a webinar on building a culture of sustainability. So I hope you'll be able to join us for that webinar next month as we move forward into November. And here I'd like to welcome Mark Buckley. And if you'll just give me a moment, we'll change the controls to Mark. And I'll be right with you there. And there we go, Mark. I can see your presentation. And if you'll just give me three more seconds, I actually need to unmute you. If you'll just give me one moment, please. Mark, are you able to unmute yourself? Because I'm not able to unmute you for some reason. Can excuse us just for a second. Our speaker, if you could please uh, see if you've been sent a PIN number to enter that into the call, just in case you're also on the, on the line.
Hello? Yes, I can hear you now, Mark. Thank you, you Angela. I'm so well? sorry. Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure being with you today, and um, hopefully I can share with you a little bit of um, uh, our perspective in terms of trends that we're seeing in environmental, uh, environmentally preferable um, practices as it, re as it relates to purchasing today. Um, uh, initially, I'll do a little context setting, uh, hopefully um, set up some conversation around uh, the role that um, procurement plays in sustainability and sustainable um, organizations. Um, and also provide you a little bit of backdrop of, of some of the things that Staples has been working on as, as a, a way of, um, of, of example. So um, the way that many businesses are starting to think about sustainable business, and this is probably not new for the folks on the, on the call, is you know, there's this evolution of sustainable business that's moved from a compliance mode, which was really um, in place um, back in the 70s and 80s when some of the first environmental legislation came into being. Um, and really it focused on um, regulation and, and really meeting the minimum standards uh, in terms of uh, environmental performance. Um, about 15 or 20 years ago, companies started to, to self-report and to create um, this, these positions around um, corporate uh, social responsibility and started to report on uh, many of their metrics. Now companies are really starting to move into uh, to, to this right quadrant, and, and, and that is really looking at um, generating business value uh, for themselves and for their communities by, by really looking at um, uh, the role that they play um, not only within communities that they operate in but across an interdependent global supply chain. So um, this is no, this is again not, not, not um, uh, news for, for many of you on the phone, but clearly um, global consumption and, and resource pressures continue to be problematic um, with 3.1 billion people in developing economies um, they're consuming resources at the same rate or maybe even more than the developed world, and it's putting intense pressures on natural systems. Uh, how do these global trends you know, impact business? Well, businesses really are in flux, right? So there's resource depletion of raw materials and energy resources. There's tremendous commodity volatility in the marketplace today. There are regulatory pressures that didn't exist many years ago and uh, not, not related to just um, uh, federal or country legislation, but you know, in, in the case of the United States or in, in Europe, you're talking about uh, country, provincial, and, and state regulations as well. Um, there are inherently su um, increasing supply chain risks. A lot of it is um, is the result of climate change or social and, and civil conflict, and we see that um, in many, many supply chains today. Um, there's a need and, and a desire for increased transparency and reporting and corporate governance. Um, by both investors and stakeholders. And we're starting to see this emergence of really non-traditional customers and suppliers that are moving into to what was a traditional um, uh, supply slash value chain. So sustainable business, well, why now? Um, why, is, why is it important now? Now is the right time to really look at environmentally preferable procurement strategies. Um, again, due to the limited resources, um, challenging economy and, and pressure to deliver more value to your organization. Um, we're seeing, you know, again, those trends in, in commodity pressures on inter interdependent global supply chains, you know, manifest themselves uh, around the world. Um, your customers have changing attitudes towards sustainability and purchasing, particularly millennials. Um, the sphere of influence that um, procurement professionals and, and others in this space have is expanded. So sort of identifying the boundaries of, of what that responsibility is or could be and what those, um, those responsibilities and new opportunities might be um, are things that hopefully we can, we can discuss um, as we go through the, the presentation today. Um, you know, and lastly, how do we build a, a sustainable business ethic not only within the organization um, and, and actually create a cultural evolution versus cult, culture shift? Um, so while this may take a little bit longer, how do, how do we embed these, um, these ethical components you know, into the way that we think about the work that we do each and every day, and how can we effectively unleash the, the eco-advantage uh, through that expanded network? And um, I'm going to share with you just some um, quickly some slides um, that reflect um, changing attitudes within business um, and business leaders towards sustainability. So this was a survey that was done last winter by the MIT Sloan School of Management. And um, you know, how has your organization's um, business model changed as a result of sustainability? As you can see, the majority of, of, um, of 
uh, business leaders are saying yes that it is. Um, is pursuing sustainably um, sustainability related strategies necessary to be competitive? Overwhelmingly, it is um, either today or folks believe that it will be in the future. In general, how do you believe your organization's sustainability related actions slash decisions have affected its profitability? Uh, the majority of folks uh, are, are, are believe that either it's adding to profit or neither added nor subtracted from profit. Um, and obviously there's folks there that don't know. Overall, has your organization developed a clear business case or proven value proposition for addressing sustainability? Um, again, uh, a fairly large uh, percentage say that in fact they have um, or they have tried to, but it's a bit difficult to develop. And has your organization, how, how has your organization's commitment to sustainability in terms of management, attention, investments changed over the past year? Um, as you can see, significantly um, uh, or somewhat increased. So it's not business as usual. And, you know, in terms of the commitments to sustainability in terms of management, attention, and investment uh, change in the year ahead, again, it will increase significantly or somewhat. So, um, again, folks are, are looking at sustainability as an uh, investment opportunity, um, building capabilities within their businesses. And then last but not least, you know, to the best of your knowledge, which of the following best describes the status of sustainability on the agenda of your organization's top management? Um, it's either on the agenda or it's, um, it's um, uh, in not core or it's been a permanent fixture and is really part of core uh, business strategy and that's the majority of business leaders. And again, the study was just uh, conducted about a year ago. So I think this sort of accurately reflects what we're seeing in the marketplace, particularly in our contract business from, uh, from many of our customers. So uh, that's all great, right? But um, for folks that operate in this space, you know, the, there's, there's a lot of other pressures and they're not related to sustainability. So uh, how do I get my job done, right? And, and so w welcome back to reality. Um, you know, I've got commodity price volatility that I'm dealing with. Uh, there are budgetary pressures within organizations to manage P&Ls. Um, there's, you know, contracting department bandwidth within within many purchasing groups, and in some respects, there's economic slowdown or you know very very mild recovery. So how do I how do I focus on on green with all of those things um, on my plate? And I think the big the biggest challenge and the biggest impediment that we're seeing is is this: it's language. And you know, while it sounds simple. You know, language has the ability to, to bring us together and connect us, but it also has the ability to separate us and, um, uh, and, 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 and make communication difficult. So what do I mean? If you read this statement today, here today, um, uh, I don't know about you, but I have a wife and two lovely daughters, and I, I don't subscribe to this statement. Um, but if I were to look at this statement, same words, different inflection, but totally different meaning, right? So it um, just goes to prove that, that, that we need to create um, a language that uh, everybody across uh, interdependent global supply chains understand. In business, um, we've been very fortunate that we've had you know, a couple of hundred years of, of um, business language that's been built uh, and an understanding of that language. So for those of you on the phone that have a business background, I'm sure that we could put you in a room uh, together looking at a business plan and in five minutes could probably determine whether that business plan uh, had merit or did, didn't have merit based on um, what you know about this language. But as we talk about, um, as we talk about green, and we talk about the environment, uh, what's interesting is that you know, there's, a, there's a, a lot of things that start to, to, to find their way into the conversation. Some of it has to do with um, political points of view, personal biases, and so forth. And the, the result is that sometimes it's very difficult to get that conversation started depending on uh, who it is you're having the conversation with. So clearly, um, as we start to look at environmentally preferable purchasing policies, it's important that we start to create a common language or a common vernacular that, um, as I said before, everybody understands. And right now, um, in, many, in many circles, that that's lacking. Uh, so where do, where do we begin? Um, organizations really need to begin by, by starting to, to create some, uh, some common goals and communicating those goals throughout the organization. So um, I've just used this as an example. This is 
Um, this is sort of our overarching sustainability strategy, um, uh, our aspirational goals, uh, the five pillars of areas of focus that we that we're looking to to drive change in within our organization, and a foundation built on metrics, targets, and building integration, and then also um, customer and associate engagement and capability building. Again, how do we how do we create that common language and how do we communicate it so that um, everybody understands um, uh, these metrics, everybody understands these strategies, um, and, uh, um, and and we can deliver um, um, we can we can deliver on the goals and targets that we've established above. Like many organizations, we're not we're no different. Staples isn't different. You start with um, things that you think you can control first, and so we started really looking at sustainability within the four walls of our business. So things uh, focused on you know, energy and carbon management, uh, waste reduction and recycling, chemical management, and just sort of building operational efficiencies at every level of our business, whether it's data centers or call centers or distribution centers, fleets and support operations. Um, not surprisingly, uh, as you start to, to, to build those programs, um, people start to understand that there's a course, corresponding environmental and social benefit with many of these um, these efficiency uh, initiatives, and you're able to start to make those links for people, and it's a it's a great place for people to to start to understand what the connection is between sustainability and their core business. Um, for Staples, um, we have you know thousands of um, of facilities, uh, thousands of trucks in our fleet, um, and a very large footprint, but. It pales in comparison to our supply chain footprint. So only 7% of our global footprint, um, based on embedded um, embedded carbon, is is the is the result of um, our operations. The other 3% is, is is built into the products that we purchase and that we sell. So um, while we 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 are one of the world the uh, country's largest users of renewable energy, and while we've reduced our energy consumption per and our energy intensity per square foot by 30 percent or more and reduced our, our, our uh, fleet emissions, they pale in comparison to the, the impact areas um, in our supply chain. So they're almost immaterial unless we can really figure out how to, how to uh, impact those, uh, those impact areas. So for us, it's not just office products. We have a full range of businesses that we, um, that we operate in, everything from print solutions to we're the largest reseller of cleaning products, uh, many of them green in the, in the, uh, in the country, uh, large um, supplier of technology, the largest reseller of, um, of, of furniture and, and in, in the country, and, and um, the largest promotional products company. So embedded in each one of these, we have um, uh, large footprints as well, and we need to figure out you know, where we can, we can impact uh, those areas, not only in terms of products that we're purchasing, but the, um, the solutions that we provide our customers. Uh, many of the products, um, and uh, many of you on the phone obviously are familiar with many of these um, these eco standards. Um, we have many um, certified products. Uh, the ones on the left typically are looking at um, you know one or two uh, environmental attributes in a product. So, for example, if you're if you're looking at Energy Star as um, as um, as a standard, it, it really only speaks to the energy consumption. Um, of a particular piece of equipment. It doesn't necessarily um, speak to the, um, the manufacturing processes, the toxicity of the materials going into the, um, into the product, um, its ease of recyclability at the end of life, and so forth, whereas EP, the, the corresponding standard on the right-hand side, is much more focused on a life cycle approach, really understanding all of those impact areas. So, um, so as we start to think about um, as we start to think about the impact areas um, in our supply chains, regardless of who we are and what we're buying, um, we need to think about it holistically from raw material input uh, to the impacts associated with manufacturing. Uh, how do we get it to market and to the customer? How does the customer use it? And then ultimately what happens to it at the end of its life and what responsibility do we have in, in, in terms of recovering that material and putting it back into new product? So, um, so clearly it's not enough just to have a... Uh, uh, an environmental certification, we need to think more broadly. And um, life cycle assessments and the, uh, give us an idea of where the major environmental impact areas are um, associated with a particular product. So we don't need to necessarily do a full life cycle uh, impact assessment to really understand what the big impact areas are. 
um, in uh, commodities or products that we purchase, uh, but it allows us then to start to focus on those areas as we start to think about putting together an environmentally preferable um, uh, purchasing policy. And as a result, what we're starting to see, and it goes back to this, this conversation of language, is that we're starting to see uncommon collaboration by many competitors. Uh, a sustainability consortium was really um, uh, uh, an, an effort by Walmart initially to get um, to build that common language across a, a wide range of consumer-facing uh, products. Uh, the Sustainable Apparel Coalition has, has done the same thing, mobilized, um, mobilized competitors together to really start to create that common language around apparel. So um, this is very, very important and, and by the way, very hopeful um, um, work that's being done and it's important that we, we start to create that, um, that universal um, language and, the, and that understanding um, within supply chain. Uh, there's also increased transparency. So for, for us at Staples, we're able to provide customers um, uh, pretty radical transparency in terms of um, what their purchasing looks like and it, it allows our customers to start to establish um, a baseline by which they can start to make changes to hopefully achieve some of their uh, environmental procurement uh, goals and objectives. But more and more businesses are creating, you know, this kind of transparency for end users. And so uh, vendors and suppliers, uh, you know, again, have a lot of information. Uh, many times we just need to ask for it. Um, so what's procurement's role in building a sustainable organization? Well, you know, clearly, uh, it's, it's huge. Um, the ability to shape and control markets by creating transparency and supplier relationships. Um, the ability to build an environmentally preferable pur purchasing policy and build that criteria into purchasing RFPs and RFIs. And even if you're not ready to make a, a decision based on that criteria, um, that signals um, a, a huge sea change uh, to the marketplace and gets suppliers thinking differently about their obligation uh, to customers moving forward. Uh, challenging the status quo is really important, you know, and, and many times our customers are the ones that ask us the hard questions that we haven't um, either thought about or have, have, um, have not really um, grappled with yet, and, and it's important that um, our customers continue to challenge us. Um, you know, procurement professionals really um, that, that understand this, this role and speak the language of sustainability obviously are going to be able to deliver economic as well as social and environmental value to uh, 21st century organizations. And, and quite candidly, if, if you're in the procurement role today, and, and I, I believe if you don't understand that today, uh, five or 10 years down the road, I, I don't believe that you'll be in that role um, in the future. I think it's that, that critical. Um, strategies to think about in tough economic times, I mean, where, where do you begin? Um, again, focus on the low hanging fruit, you know, focus on things like um, energy and waste. Um, it's pretty simple, but there's a direct typically a direct economic return on focusing on those two areas first. Um, linking in social and environmental performance with key company strategies is really important. How does sustainability become an enabler for what uh, the organization's um, uh, key objectives are um, and strategy? Um, engaging suppliers and vendors um, and sharing your goals and objectives is really, really important. Um, it's important that they understand you have goals and objectives, and even if you're not ready to execute against them today, um, or that you're moving toward that, that they, they understand that they need to be prepared for, for those kinds of questions and, um, and, uh, um, and that kind of response moving forward. Uh, it's important to create sort of values-based versus strictly transactional-based relationships with suppliers. Um, and then really start to ask for transparency in the supply chain, ask for reporting, ask for what kind of information you know, um, uh, your suppliers have, and then locate the true win-win-wins, um, you know, as, as they come about and communicate them enthusiastically. That's a great way to accelerate um, um, support within an organization and, and actually get the ball rolling. Um, where is your, your organization today? Well, the, the big challenge is, you know, it, you can't, you, you really can't improve performance on a base that you don't understand. So it's important to, to start to establish base level performance metrics. Even if they're very, you know, very elementary, it's important to do it now. Um, how do we convert existing business data to corresponding environmental impact? There's many pieces of data that businesses and organizations have um, that you can easily um, uh, cor develop corresponding environmental impacts from. And, and again, important to start to figure out where those might be. How do we systemically start to capture that data going forward? And then 
uh, focus on metrics that you can control. I mean, uh, pricing is one metric, obviously, but um, focus on consumption, too. Uh, so it, whether you're buying energy, you, know, you might have a great price in a deregulated market, but if you can't control consumption on the back end, it really doesn't matter. So, um, so think about both ends of, that, um, of the equation. Um, creating a sustainability ethic you know, that extends throughout your organization is important. Creating the opportunities to link sustainability and strategic business goals and communicate them internally and externally to associates, suppliers, and customers is really important so that you start to, to create that continu continuity across the value chain. Um, leverage the bandwidth of your supply chain network. You know, you may have a relationship with a tier one supplier, um, but you need to get information on a tier four supplier up the, up the supply chain. And the only way to do that is to really start to figure out how you develop um, relationships beyond that tier one supplier. Um, you know, ask your suppliers and prospective vendors about their environmental goals and objectives. Many times they have information that they will ready, readily share with you as customers um, that will help you on your journey. And then how do you unleash that eco advantage in your, in, in your organization and supply chain? Um, so the internal sustainability ethic is, again, are, are, there, are there internal efficiency gains um, that, um, uh, that might be the result of things like quality programs like Six Sigma and, and ISO certification that could actually be translated into a corresponding environmental or social benefit to communicate those links internally. Um, we, have, um, we have a number of black belts within our organization that focus on Six Sigma, and it's interesting because many of them, when you, when you have a conversation with them about um, are, they working on, are they working on a sustainability project, you know, they, they, they have no idea <laughs> they're working on a sustainability project. Um, until you actually start to show them, based on a, a project that they're working on, where that corresponding uh, environmental benefit is, and, and, and all of a sudden there's that aha moment, and they say, "Oh my goodness, of course, that's uh, there's a corresponding energy benefit or a you know um, a human capital benefit and so forth." And so I think those are the kinds of, of, of opportunities that um, you you can use to to um, uh, to find internal champions that are willing to actually. Um, help you um, as you start to develop an environmentally preferable um, uh, purchasing policy. Um, the external sustainability ethic, as I mentioned before, your vendors have you know a, a lot of information. Um, start to ask them, you know, and these, this is the kind of you know standardizing contract language and lease language that requires transparency and reporting. Um, these are just you know easy easy things to incorporate in a request for proposal, request for information. Um, ask them whether they have, you know, their, their, their products or, or their operations are third-party certified. Um, and, you know, it, it should be a, an opportunity for you to really um, assess whether a vendor or supplier is operating their business with an eye toward um, sustainability. Because inherently, over, over a long period of time, they're going to have the lowest uh, long-term cost model and probably the best overall value proposition if they're thinking about these. If you have a supplier, for example, that's not thinking about um, uh, carbon or energy, then uh, I would argue that you're probably paying too much. Um, as I mentioned before, standardizing RFI and RFP language is, is really, really um, uh, important. Um, how, do we, how do we share overarching environmental goals and objectives in, uh, through, in, in sustainability reporting with prospective vendors? If you have goals and objectives, again, sharing them is really, really um, uh, critical. Encourage vendors to supply information on you know, waste reduction, recycling, uh, recycled content, energy, carbon intensity, logistics, and end-of-life solutions for problematic materials in your supply chain. Uh, we all have them, and, and sometimes um, there are solutions out there we just need to ask. And, and again, building that into a, a, a question or a qualifying question and a questionnaire with a request for information or request for proposal might be a good place to do that. Um, do your suppliers have third-party, you know, um, uh, certified environmental management systems, and, and if they do, what are they? And, uh, and again, there are plenty of them out there, and those are things you might want to ask for. Uh, can they report um, on a regular basis, you know, um, uh, on benchmarks and 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 uh, and data that are important important for you in terms of your goal setting and important for them uh, long term? You know, building that into an RFP and RF, RFI is 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 a great way to sort of uh, you know convey that that intent um, and to start to uh, engage in those conversations with your suppliers. For those of you who are, who are um, uh, responsible for buildings, um, again, green building design 
huge opportunity um, at Staples. We, you know, we have annual prototypical reviews where we engage our procurement teams, our architectural teams, construction, engineering, real estate, and um, and operations teams. And what it allows us to do is really look at our standard prototypical plans and specifications and make sure that we have the, um, the most efficient um, elements in our prototype. So it's not just first cost, but we're thinking about life cycle cost and, and impact. And, uh, and again, um, everything from you know, the core of the building, uh, the shell of the building, uh, and the, you know, uh, the components within the building, thinking about those and how they're going to operate. So it's not just initial cost, but it's really thinking about what the life cycle impacts you know, are um, over the long term. And we've been doing this for a number of years. And, and again, we didn't call it sustainability. We just thought this was, you know, good smart business. Um, so many of you um, that are dealing with um, buildings and are looking at um, lease language, you know, there's a, there's a, a lot of conversation these days around um, green leases and green lease language. Um, I think the, the things to focus on from our perspective is um, these are some elements here that, that, that really, um, you know, make sense as you're negotiating for uh, for space or even or building out a new building. Uh, make sure that you're separately metering utilities so that you you know you can track your consumption and you can control those. You can start to set goals around that. Um, call for energy efficiency lighting and HVAC systems um, if there's an opportunity where you're purchasing power. You know, look at renewable as a, as an option. Um, make sure that there's comprehensive recycling services available. Um, you know, in the building. Many times what happens is that um, uh, tenants will pay for what, what's termed common area maintenance and um, uh, waste removal typically and, and, and other charges are straight line pass-throughs to the landlord uh, to the tenant. So there's really no vested interest by the landlord to, to, to sort of build any efficiency in there necessarily and ultimately you as a tenant pay for it and uh, obviously the environmental impact is, is, is not one that you know, a, a green tenant would be looking for. Um, how do you negotiate those, you know, those conditions as part of your common area maintenance to make sure that you have a green tenant benefit? Um, when you locate a, a, a building, look for transportation options like mass transit, carpooling, bikes, et cetera. Um, specify a minimum lead standard. You know, many, many, uh, many, many uh, um, uh, uh, building uh, building tenants are are starting to to do this, and and for those of you who um, who operate in this space, as you know, in many municipalities today, um, LEED is sort of the de facto building standard for for um, commercial buildings in excess of 10,000 square feet, you know, uh, minimum LEED standard or higher. Um, and then there are, obviously, there are buildings that qualify for tax incentives and other econo economic development benefits and advantages. Um, and take that, you know, take this thinking as you start to look at things like operating leases, so whether it's for IT equipment or fleet operations and so forth, there are things that you can build into your standard operating lease that really um, make the, um, the provider um, responsible for thinking about, you know, what happens to the existing, um, you know, fl fleet of copy machines that I have, are they going to be environmentally responsibly recycled, and can you make that a condition of, um, of the operating lease and sort of build that in. So there's a lot that can be done on the front end um, to sort of standardize you know, green lease language that gives you as a tenant or you as a as as an operating leaseholder um, much more power and um, and the ability to actually um, uh, make changes in, in, in the environmental impact um, of of those relationships. Um, taking uh, you know the, obviously the supply chain um, and the value chain benefits um, are are pretty. Are pretty self-evident. You know, taking a life cycle approach to supply chain re reduces waste, improves efficiencies, and, and typically reduces costs. Um, understanding your supply chain and value chain is also a great opportunity to ide identify supply chain risks and uncover you know hidden opportunities. Again, the ability to go back maybe beyond your tier one or tier two supplier, you know, allows you to better understand you know the pressures that um, uh, that your business um, might be facing as a result of um, of supply chains that might present risks. Um, you know, uncommon collaboration is really something that we're seeing more and more of in the sustainability space. And you know, find ways to uncover that uncommon collaboration that leads to long-term strategic partnerships with non-traditional stakeholders. Uh, they could be NGOs, they could be um, you know uh, industry organizations or sustainability organizations. I think um, 
there are, there, are, there are a lot more resources out there today than there were for um, procurement professionals even just a couple of short years ago. Um, and then obviously, as I said before, it accelerates the development of transformational business models and markets because at the end of the day, what we want to try and do is reset um, um, environmentally preferable uh, purchasing, um, reset that to the new standard, the new normal, right? So that's, that's how all purchasing should be done. And, and I think that's the ultimate goal for, for many of us that are working in this space. Um, you know, how do you unleash your organization's environmental or eco advantage? Um, you know, monitor global trends. Um, a low-cost market or a low-cost commodity today um, might be that today, but would it be tomorrow? So if you're purchasing energy from a coal-fired power plant that's cheap today, uh, is it going to be when, you know, new carbon regulations come into effect or where you're paying for cap-and-trade, um, you're paying a cap-and-trade price for carbon in places like California or here in the Northeast? Um, you know, challenge the status quo. I mean, uh, the way that we've always done it isn't going to get it done anymore. So, I mean, don't be afraid to, to, to use that opportunity to ask those questions. Um, you know, again, leveraging your sustainability sphere of influence, not only within the organization, to find um, uh, key partners and, and, to, and sponsors and supporters, but also outside the organization. How do you, how do you sort of expand your, your world and think about the boundaries of the work that you do much more broadly? Um, setting and communicating goals and targets to your organization's supply chain partners over and over and over again is critical. Um, if you're not having these conversations on a regular basis, there's, um, there's going to be a tendency that you're not going to get to everybody, and as a result, there'll be a breakdown somewhere. And so it's really important to continue to find ways, opportunities to have these kinds of conversations with, um, with your partners in the supply chain. Um, providing feedback to all stakeholders in a the language they understand, again, is really, really critical. Um, that continues to transform, uh, you know, the way that the market operates and the way that um, we think about sustainability and the big impact areas. Uh, and ultimately, we think that this approach, you know, really will help companies and organizations lead, compete, and win in the new green economy of the 21st century. Um, again, um, I appreciate the opportunity to share with you, you know, um, some of our observations, you know, in this space. Um, there's a lot of resources available today. Um, the EPA obviously has um, some tremendous resources relative to um, Green Suppliers Network, um, the um, Environmentally Preferable Purchasing link, um, and then obviously you know, understanding about green claims um, and the, uh, the FTC green uh, guidelines were just changed about a year and a half ago or so, and uh, I'd encourage you to maybe take a look at those. Um, uh, NGOs are really great partners in this process. So, you know, whether it's WWF or Environmental Defense Fund, you know, NRDC, uh, WRI, or um, BSR, um, these are all good organizations for you to, to connect with. Um, many of them have um, many of them have focus areas on 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 green procurement and can provide you know really some 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 great um, great information and some great case studies um, by which you can model your own. Um, you know your own approach to, and um, and last but not least, there are other you know resources like the U.S. Green Buildings Council. Um, obviously, a lot of focus around LEED, um, and these are just a couple of websites that you know uh, I've found to be helpful. They're um, they're sort of daily newsletters that, um, that that kind of keep you up to to date on what's going on in the world of sustainability and how um, organizations are um, are dealing with challenges. And it's a great opportunity to kind of learn about you know what leaders are doing in this space. So, um, you know, with that, I've kind of run through this fairly quickly, but I, I appreciate your attention this morning and um, be happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. That was a really compelling presentation with so much information. And I really liked uh, how you were able to cover starting internally throughout Staples and also looking externally throughout your supply chain through your Tier 1 all the way to your Tier 4 suppliers. Um, just to give you a moment, there are a lot of questions for you in the chat box uh, to give you a moment to look those over and uh, see how we can answer some of our participants' questions today as well. For our audience, if you could please type your comments and questions into the chat box as well, that would be fantastic. So Mark can go ahead and give you some more insight into a concept or into something compelling that you are really interested in learning more about.
something I found really interesting that you presented today is 70% uh, see sustainability as an investment opportunity. That uh, percentage has really uh, shot through the roof in the last couple of years, and that's really good news for the management discipline of, of sustainability as to how important it has actually become to stakeholders uh, for, throughout the investment world, throughout our customers, and throughout our own employees as well. Yeah, I mean, I think some of the questions, I can maybe lump them together. I mean, I think, um, you know, there's there are a couple of questions relative to, you know, how that's changing and why. Um, there's one question here specifically about why only 26% of the leaders said that sustainability is a permanent fixture and, and part of core strategy. And again, I think um, I think that that's probably up from where it was a few years ago. Um, but I but I also think there's a there's a couple of dynamics that I see anyway. One, um, there's a generational um, there's a, there's still generational change that's happening at the top of organizations where I think. Um, there's more traditional business, and then there are, there are leaders now that are a bit younger. That um, you know, sustainability is really um, is is sort of part and parcel to how business should get done. So I think it's starting to change. And I also think that you know, many companies look at other companies in their sector and are trying to um, to 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 figure out um, how they're doing it and how they're actually building this into core strategy. So I, I do think that there's been you know, some change. Um, is it happening fast enough? Probably not for anybody on the call, and maybe not for me. But, but I think it's um, it's it's clearly moving in the right direction. Uh, the um, and again, the, the, there was another comment here about many leaders may not understand how the overarching concept of sustainability um, is, and that it, it, it touches all all parts of the business. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think it's amazing to me how many times you sit down and have a conversation with a, a senior leader in, in our own organization, and they'll be working on, a, on a, an efficiency project or they'll be working on um, something else, and they just don't view it as a sustainability project. They, they, they think, well, we, we're doing this because we're saving money. It's like, well, you're, you're doing this because you're building efficiency into the system. The system becomes more efficient and less impactful on the environment. Um, and therefore, there's a corresponding environmental benefit, and they and many times that's their aha moment. They go, oh wow, I, I get that now. And and so I think again, it comes back to creating that you know that that, that common language for folks um, um, so that they can understand it. Um, does does Staples have a, a specific standard when it comes to choosing which products or brands they resell? Do these products have to be go accredited. Um, so I, it's a great question. Um, given the the number of SKUs that we have, a number of individual products. So right now in our assortment, we have about we have um, over a million uh, individual products in our assortment. So I would say that um, you know right now we're we're looking for um, third-party uh, environmental accreditation for many of them, um, uh, and the ones where um, in the categories where there aren't eco standards set today, we're trying to again focus on what are the big impact areas and which of those products actually, um, um, you know, reflect the, 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 the least, um, uh, you know, environmental impact where we can. Um, obviously, it's one component among many in terms of what we choose and how we buy. Um, so, so clearly, um, if something costs three times as much as a, a, another product that, you know, we're, we're going to have to be somewhat um, sensitive to that. But our longer-term goal, particularly with our own branded product, is that is to actually um, start to change that um, uh, that that the, the um, reset the new normal ourselves. So the idea is how do we how do we take the less sustainable product off the shelf and then move to a, a higher environmental standard and shift the marketplace and not give the customer a choice. So I'll give you one quick example. If you walk into any staple store today and you want a copy job done at the copy center, uh, standard copy job, it's being printed on 50% post-consumer recycled FSC certified, you know, 90, 92 bright, 24 pound printer paper. There's not a single sign there that says this is an environmental paper. It's just a high quality copy job, um, you know, done, you know, at a price that is competitive. And and we are fundamentally shifting the market demand um, on behalf of the customer without them you know, necessarily asking for it because what we've found, unfortunately, is that um, customers don't um, 
don't necessarily vote with their pocketbooks, and they don't necessarily vote um, when you give them a choice. So if we can meet fit, form, and function, and we can uh, provide a better environmental alternative, that's what we think is, is, is better for us. Um, language of sustainability, a couple of examples of the concept. Um, sure, so, um, so for example, there's a, um, uh, you know, there, there's been a lot of discussion over the last several years around um, biodegradable products. And, um, and again, a biodegradable product, you know, um, that can't be composted is probably, or doesn't have a composting, um, there's not a composting mechanism uh, to recover that and actually uh, degrade it, is going to probably either go to a landfill or an incinerator. So uh, if only 5% of that material gets composted, then I would argue that it's probably you know, not biodegradable. And we stay away from the term biodegradable, you know, depending on uh, the product and, and where we think it'll end up. So um, again, I think the, um, I think the, um, the FTC has done a really good job of, of developing some green guidelines that, um, that start to make clear those, you know, um, the, uh, those, those differences in terms of terminology and language and, and, and claims that can be made and not made. But, um, but anyway, there's, um, there's, there's certainly plenty of those kinds of examples of, of where we need to, uh, you know, um, uh, we, we need to change the, um, the language. And as you talk about, um, you know, going back to tier one, two, three, four suppliers, it's really important that all through that supply chain that everybody has the same understanding of a, of a, of, um, a piece of language or a term so that, um, you know, again, we're, we're getting the kind of information or, uh, on the back end that we think we, we're getting as opposed to, so we're comparing apples to apples and apples as opposed to apples, oranges, and bananas. So I think that's, um, from a purchasing standpoint, developing that consistency throughout the supply chain in, in terms of terminology that we use and language that we use is, is really critical to making sure that you get what it is that you want. Um, how do you deal with a vendor that's less than willing to be transparent about life cycles of products they sell? Uh, great question, and it really varies from from vendor to vendor and 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 product to product. Um, we've walked away from vendors in the past. Um, the big challenge for us right now, and many other uh, folks, is around chemical transparency, um, and that's uh, we've been actively involved in that um, that discussion and uh, on a national level. Uh, Roger McFadden, who works on my team, is a sort of a, a renowned green chemist, and he's really taking a leadership position on that, but. Um, you know, we've got to start somewhere, and and, uh, and the hope is that you know um, we'll continue to work with suppliers until we feel that they're they're not being um, you know they're not being responsive to you know ultimately to what we're looking for, and and um, you know we do walk away from suppliers and have in the past that um, aren't willing to um, be more transparent. Um, how does Staples uh, how is Staples asking suppliers for transparency to use a scorecard? Great question. Um, uh, again, I think there are plenty of scorecarding um, uh, efforts underway. Um, what we're trying to do is, um, is, is, is basically understand where the big impact areas are in particular product lines and focus on those until scorecards become available. Um, we have done some really in-depth um, LCA work, life cycle assessment work for some of our own branded products, um, like our remanufactured ink and toner cartridges and so forth to make sure that, um, again, even though they're remanufactured, that we're not um, we don't have unintended consequences as a result of, of remanufacturing, and want to make sure that um, we fully understand what the you know what those impact areas are. So, um, so I would say that you know we we use scorecards where they're available, and we use um, third-party certification, particularly the ones that are looking at life cycle assessments, um, level level investment standards for furniture, for example, design for the environment. You know, standard is a good is a good proxy. Uh, EP for electronics, where you know we're taking into account you know the life cycle impacts. Um, the one danger right now with everybody moving quickly to this is that you develop you know 15 different standards for the same for the same type of product, and then you create confusion in the marketplace. So we're trying not to do that. We're just trying to we're trying to what we are trying to better understand what those impact areas are based on the product. Um, interested to learn about Staples the baseline metrics for reporting. Um, sure, I'm. You know, it depends on um, depends on uh, what it is that you know we're 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 looking at. But um, 
but obviously uh, depends on product category. Um, obviously, we we try and 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 look at um, uh, you know third party certification uh, from a life cycle perspective where it's available um, as a de facto standard. We'll we'll look at and you know a proxy will look at um, you know a, a standard that. Um, you know that that reflects one or two environmental attributes. So, for example, I might have a paper product that's FSC certified, Forest Stewardship Council certified. It speaks to the uh, the land management practice in the forest. It also speaks to the chain of custody by which the fiber you know went went to the product. But you could argue that um, that's only one part of the environmental footprint. And I would argue that you're right. Um, the the other is um, associated with things like um, um, you know mill performance uh, emissions. Um, you know, bleaching. There's a whole range of other things that don't get communicated under an FSC level. So, um, what we're trying to do is to start to develop baselines where there's um, where there are metrics and there are certification standards available, and and then start to develop um, goals and objectives. You know, um, you know, to build on each of those. So, I would say that right now there are at, at various stages of development, depending on the product and, and product category, but. But, but clearly that work is underway and we're, we're excited about it, where it's going. Um, agree metrics on consumption cost savings is essential to show progress on project management. Yeah, it's, um, it's really critical and again sometimes as sustainability professionals, you know, we, we're focused on the things that, um, that um, historically, um, you know, our metrics that we measure from a sustainability standpoint that may have no, you know, have no um, Impact or, or um, perceived benefit from someone else in the organization that doesn't understand this. So, the ability for us to to, to look at, uh, for example, energy use, um, we might look at it as um, a reduction in greenhouse gases um, based on the fuel mix for the for the for the power that's being generated. Uh, somebody that's focused on an operational part of the business is just interested in how much money they're saving or the intensity of of energy less less they're using today. Um, and so, how do we create, you know, how do we create a, um, a different set of metrics, maybe, or a different um, conversation with somebody in operations versus somebody who's who's managing um, uh, for sustainability reporting? And then, um, and so, I, th I think th that that's still work underway, and that 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 goes back to, you know, sort of creating that common vernacular and common language and conversation. Uh, what are some credible third-party certifiers of environmental management plans? Uh, well, there. Are Plenty of them out there. I mean, obviously, um, you know, there's um, there's a, there's a number of ISO standards, ISO 14001, um, and and so forth. But the certifiers are, you know, there are there are organizations out there like um, you know Bureau Veritas and and um, SGS, and there's a number of others that you know can come in and actually do third party um, certifying and auditing of uh, of environmental management systems and plans. Um, See how do buyers decide on what products to sell in the store? The staples have uh, offer preferential uh, status to manufacturers and supplies. You know, um, I would say uh, not yet in all categories. I would say in some of the categories that we've been engaged in um, for a longer period of time, such as paper and so forth, I would say that in fact um, uh, we do obviously. Um, but I, I think uh, in other categories, you know, some of those metrics. And some of those certifications are are still just being developed. So, um, so we're, we're you know we're, I would say that we're at various stages of, of development. And, you know, uh, based on the product category that um, that we're selling. Uh, let's see. Covering. Thank you for covering green building considerations and construction and social form. Oh, great. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, you know, green building considerations are really really important. Not just um, in terms of new building construction, but obviously. Um, in terms of ex existing building, um, obviously, uh, you know, Leeds done a great job. And the U.S. Bu Green Buildings Council has done a great job of, of not only looking at you know uh, new construction but existing building, and uh, so there's certainly an awful lot of opportunity to to start to um, uh, provide a um, a lens to how uh, buildings are performing. Because many, as many of you know, um, you know, the early days of LEED uh, buildings were certified, and then what, what happened was that um, they weren't performing as we had hoped. And um, and uh, and when you went back and recommissioned the building, a lot of the um, systems that were in place through energy management systems, et cetera, you know, had been you know had either been 
uh, bypassed or, or whatnot. So um, this focus now on the life cycle of how a building operates is, I think, a, a really good, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a really good step by USGBC, and um, I think more and more companies are, are, are starting to, to look at that. Um, Staples have the participate in GRI, and if so, match your EPP to that framework. Yeah, so um, so we do report um, um, under GRI um, for um, those areas that are material to our business. So we have been since um, 2003. Um, and does it match our EPP? Do we match our EPP to that framework? In some cases, yes. I would say in other cases, there are gaps. Um, are there other frameworks that you'd use um, to guide language and criteria so all obligations are integrated? Again, there's um, there's there's a lot of work being done right now. Um, um, there's a lot of work being done um, right now in certain supply chains to 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 do that. Um, there's a lot of collaborative work. Uh, as I mentioned before, the sustainability consortia is really taking a look at a number of product categories and is starting to do that. So. I would encourage you to get maybe engaged with some of those um, those efforts um, and uh, and see what you know what opportunities there might be. Uh, what is the biggest bang for your buck within EPP? Hmm. Um, you know, it, it's hard to tell. I mean, I I, I think you know there, there's certainly um, I, I think the biggest bang for our buck as as we think about it is that it be, it, we become more intimately engaged in our supply chain. And so some of the some of the benefits, believe it or not, are not environmental. Um, some of them have to do with really sensing what the, the next big trends are going to be relative to commodity pressures and so forth. Um, and again, that goes back to just better understanding your supply chain and uh, and being more engaged in supply chain. So I think that's the biggest benefit. But um, but I think the the other benefit is really that we, along with others like you, that are are really pushing EPP, are fundamentally transforming the marketplace. And I think um, that's that's good news for everybody. Um, the Staples uh, leverage buying power with some vendors, uh, partners to facilitate buying power to facilitate EPP of certain products. If so, with whom and what? Hmm. Um, interesting. I would say not directly. I would say that the and, and the only reason is uh, for you know antitrust reasons. But I would say that. Um, we we do send market signals the right way. I mean uh, that way to the to the business. So uh, for example, um, we were a member of the paper working group back in 2003 that really started to establish some um, standards and a common language around uh, paper procurement. And um, we developed um, a, a tool along with 10 other companies called EPAT, Environmental Performance Assessment Tool, that's now part of Green Blue. Um, that again, I think went a long way to start to create that common language. So there were 10 or 12 companies that, you know, wanted to increase the um, environmentally preferable paper in the market, the, the, the availability, um, yet we all had different definitions with, for what that was and, and, and looked at the, a little bit differently at the impact areas. And so this created a common, um, sort of a common standard and a common metric. So that, um, that um, allowed paper buyers on the back end to, again, compare apples, apples, and apples as opposed to apples, oranges, and bananas. So I would say um, we've been pretty successful there. And then we, we work on a number of other collaboratives, too, to, to, to try and send the right market signals. We did you know, some work collaboratively with WRI um, and the Green Power Market Development Group. So we were part of a group that uh, developed 1,000 megawatts of commercial, um, uh, new commercial uh, renewable energy by 2010 over about an eight-year period. And, uh, and again, having that kind of collaborative um, um, Clout and cooperation went a long way to, to kind of moving the needle. We were, you know, we, we collaborated on, uh, I think, the first commercial, large-scale commercial sale of um, renewable energy certificates. And so that, that sort of helped um, establish the capability around RECs, you know, et cetera. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Angela, I don't know if we have time. Do we have time to go through any more of these? or? These are wonderful questions, everyone, and we really appreciate the uh, curiosity. I've definitely learned a lot from you today, Mark, and I hope the other participants have as well. And uh, I really think that, you know, you've 
you're leading the way as it comes to procurement. A lot of people have been following you for years to try to figure out how do I start finding green products. And uh, that's honestly how I got started was just going to Staples and looking all the third-party certifications on your product labels and trying to understand, okay, well, what does this mean? And um, so it really helped me as a consumer and as a business owner as well. And so if I can, please, I thank you for all of the hard work that you're doing. You are really making a positive difference really around the entire world as so many of your product lines touch uh, so many uh, different resources and carefully selecting uh, who you will do business with in the future, now and in the future, is uh, really to be commendable. That's a lot of hard work. And uh, thank you so much for presenting today for on behalf of Sustainability Management Association. We're very proud of what Staples is accomplishing and you yourself and your profession. Yeah. Well, th thank you, and, and uh, thank you all for the work that you all do. Um, it's um, it, you know it's 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 really important work, and and everybody that is engaged in it is um, is is making a difference. So thank you all, uh, Angel. One last thing I, I was going to ask. Um, I'm happy to respond to the questions I didn't get to if that's. If, if that's something you're interested in. Um, if anyone who would like to stay on the call, please do. And the rest of you who do need to get to your next engagement, feel free. I uh, don't feel rude at this time. And if anyone would like to stay on the call so you can hear the rest of the answers, that would be wonderful. And if you have time, Mark, thank you so much for doing that. I really appreciate that. Um, there was a there was a, a question on how to pri how we prioritize environmental, social, and economic components of sustainability as we develop um, broad-reaching programs. Um, again, I think it's pretty specific to product category, but um, you know clearly uh, it's important to have a balance with all of those. Um, and I would say that um, you know in some cases it's probably more slanted toward um, toward social than environmental. Um, other times it might be uh, more weighted toward environmental. And um, but you know, uh, clearly there's got to be a component of each of those. You know, in the conversation, start to develop, develop sort of these broad, uh, broad programs. Um, let's see, um, I'm getting my LEED certification. I work in construction for a few years, and I've and know it's well recognized in the industry. Where can can I research? Um, the LEED certification. Um, the U.S. Green Buildings Council, so if you go to um, www.usgbc.org, um, it can give you, give you all the profiles on, on LEED certification and where you can um, find out more information on training and, uh, and testing. Uh, biodegradable is oftentimes misused. Um, I think we went through that, and I, I agree. Um, who's responsible for all of this at Staples? <laughs> We do have a sustainability department, and we do um, we do partner with um, supply chain and with every every area of the business. Um, I, I think we like to think that we have 80,000 folks, you know, within Staples globally that um, you know where sustainability is is in some way part of their job. And so our you know our challenge and our opportunity is to to figure out how to engage them and um, and um, enroll them their help in in terms of making us a more sustainable company and and um, and once you can create that ethic within your organization, it's it's really amazing to see how how um, it becomes part of everybody else's job. Because at some point, it has to be the you know it has to be in the purview of the of the folks that are um, making these decisions and are doing this work every day. And um, I, I kind of look at our role as as one of um, providing guidance um, in, in in terms of uh, of, uh, uh, of how people think about sustainability in the context of their of their own job. So. Um, I think that was the last question. Well, great. If you're ever looking for people for your sustainability team, I've got about 80, about 100 graduates every year looking for sustainability jobs. <laughs> so please come my way if you're looking for talent. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, I appreciate. I appreciate that, Angela. So, no, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for your for your time and the, and uh, folks on the line's time today. I appreciate it. And if um, you know if anything else. Um, bubbles up, please feel free to shoot me a note, Angela. Happy to try and answer any other questions. Oh, well, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate the wonderful presentation. I, I think everyone learned something that they wanted to today. Have great. a great day, everybody. And I'll be sending out the video to you and uh, the
the PowerPoint deck from Staples, he let us uh, send that out for him as well. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye now.